welcome to online worship. Thank you for joining us here at First United Methodist Church in Hollidaysburg. I hope you are blessed by worship and stay tuned for announcements afterwards. Here's a Lenten reflection. It's a devotion from Meekness Not Weakness by Harvest Ministries. Pride has been redefined in American culture as a virtue. The strong, the beautiful, the powerful, the intelligent, and the privileged take every opportunity to put themselves forward. Politicians manifest pride in speeches and debates and making every child a winner, whether they deserve it or not, and sports icons reinforce pride as the path to greatness. Probably the least admired character quality in America is meekness, and yet the greatest person who ever lived was a meek and humble man. Learn from me, for I am meek and humble in heart. Gentleness characterizes our Lord Jesus Christ. He always defended God's glory and ultimately gave himself in sacrifice for others. Jesus didn't lash back when criticized, slandered, or treated unjustly, but he did respond fittingly and firmly when God's honor was profaned or his truth was perverted or neglected. He twice cleansed the temple by force, and he repeatedly and fearlessly denounced the hypocrisy of the Jewish religious leaders. When his time of suffering came, however, Jesus submitted to the will of his father and endured the abuse and murderous intentions of the hypocritical leaders. He demonstrated meekness to the very end. While being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. Although Jesus said, blessed, happy are the meek, we don't celebrate meekness in our culture. Instead, we celebrate assertiveness. We celebrate getting things from other people, sometimes even taking advantage of other people. When is the last time you saw a movie that celebrated the virtue of meekness? When is the last time the big buildup for the movie was the moment when the good guy meekly restrains himself, even though he was wronged? We don't go to a movie like that. We want to see a payback movie in which the first half consists of bad things happening to the hero and the last half consists of bad things that come to the people who did those things to the hero. That is what entertains us and this is what our culture celebrates. May we walk in the way of meekness as Jesus did. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. On the everlasting arms Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day Leaning on the everlasting arms Leaning, leaning Safe and secure from all alarms Leaning, leaning Leaning on the everlasting arms What have I to dread? What have I to fear leaning on the everlasting arms? I have blessed peace with my Lord so near leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting We haven't had a 
children's moment online for a while, so I thought it was about time we should do that. But kids, have you ever been horseback riding? I mean, it's, it's a neat experience. Um, I haven't been around horses a whole lot. When I was really young, we had a pony. But um, I, I'd like for you to look at a couple of pictures here that will be on the screen. And um, the first one is, is actually a, a bridle. I mean, that, that's something that you put uh, around a horse and, and their heads so that, that you, you can control them. You know, if you, you're riding, sometimes you have to get them to slow down, right? And you have to get them to go one direction or the next, so you use the reins, but the, they're, they're attached to the bridle so that you can help to, to guide the horse. So the other picture that you see there is actually a bit, and a bit is what you stick into the horse's mouth. So that's part of the controlling mechanism as well to to help it to do what you want it to do. Now, what would you think if your parents had a set of those for you? <laughs> what if um, they had a bridle to try to keep you in line or if they had a bit to put in your mouth? Um, sometimes for my youngest, I think that might be very beneficial, right? But um, we don't do that with our children. But, you know, for each and every one of us, I think there are times we can be somewhat like a wild horse, kind of out of control. And um, we need to be controlled uh, by the Holy Spirit of God. And that's when we ask Jesus to come into us. I mean, we don't have to live a life for him alone. We have this power source. And the Holy Spirit helps us to be submitted. So we do what God wants us to do instead of what we want to do. So and next time you see a horse, may that just be a reminder that, yep, God let the Holy Spirit of God to send me where he wants me to go. Well, let's pray. Lord, thank you for your Holy Spirit. May you continue to guide us and help us as we submit to your authority. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you please join me in prayer? God of the universe, we are overwhelmed by your glory. We are overwhelmed by your creativity, and we thank you for this world in which we get to live. We thank you for our families, our friends, the homes that we have, the food that we have to eat. And God, we come to you on this day with troubles all our own. I ask that you help us to lay those troubles down at your feet and to leave them with you. May you fill our spirits with your peace and with the attitude that you have this all in hand. God, thank you for who you are and for what you have done for us in your son, Jesus. Help us and show us the way to walk in the light of Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, I'll be sharing two different passages of Scripture with you. Both of them are from Matthew's Gospel. The first from the Beatitudes, Matthew 5, 5. This is the New Living Translation. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. And um, this next passage, it's unique the way it lines up. It is Matthew 26, 36, 46. Uh, The 26th chapter, verses 36 to 46. Hear these words of our Lord. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and agitated. Then he said to them, I'm deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and stay awake with me. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not stay awake with me one hour? Stay awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, he went away for the second time and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. 
Again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rests? See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Uh, The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, as we begin, I'd like you to check out this picture that's there on your screen. Now, do you identify any of those three individuals? Uh, This is a photo that was taken back in 1978. The person in the center is probably familiar to many of you. That is none other than Fred Rogers of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, popular children's personality. Now, who is that big buff dude who's to his right? Well, that is bodybuilder and actor Lou Ferringo. And now we're going back to 1978. You remember what show might have been on television then? And none other than the Incredible Hulk. So Lou Ferringo was the Hulk, and then looking then to the extreme opposite side is the actor Bill Bixby, who played the role of Dr. David Banner. If you watched the show as I did back in the day, you would recall him saying, don't make me angry. You won't like it when I'm angry, right? So... Now, why were these three people in the same place at the same time? It makes sense for Bixby and Ferringo to be side by side, but why is Mr. Rogers in the middle? Well, he was doing a series of five episodes on superheroes, and so he had gone on set and met with those individuals to film his thing, so that's why the three of them were together at the same time. Okay, so where is this going? Well, here's my question for your consideration. Uh, Of these three individuals, as you look at them, which one of them best typifies meekness? Well, it's actually a trick question because none of them do. What? Well, we'll get back to that in a few moments. But for the message today, I have a couple things to share as I get started. Um, uh, Last week I had mentioned... Colin Smith from Open the Bible Ministries, and I found this amazing series on the Beatitudes that he does. Uh, Some of the content from the sermon today is some of his work, so thank you, Pastor Smith. Uh, The other thing to mention is this is a hard-hitting sermon today, and um, I don't know how you're going to take it to heart, but I want you to know I'm preaching to myself with this one, and if this is something that I need to hear and take to heart... um, it's quite possible it's something you need to hear and take to heart as well. So what does meekness mean? From the New Living Translation, we heard the word humble, but a lot of different translations would use meek. And I think in a lot of ways, we equate meekness with weakness. We might think that if someone is rather soft-spoken or demure, if someone is not assertive or or driven, or maybe even if somebody goes to shake your hand and it's not a a very firm handshake, we might think, well, that's someone who is meek. But um, really, that's not it at all. That's an improper understanding of of what meekness really is. It's um, unique if you look at the Latin word, You know, things were translated from Greek into Latin. And um, the Latin phrase for meek, translated, it means used to the hand. Used, U-S-E-D, used to the hand. So what does that mean? Well, if you're someone, you take a wild animal and you want to train it, that's not easy, is it? Uh, This past Christmas, I was watching a movie about, you know, this stallion that was just out of control, and, you know, some people wanted to put it down. They figured they couldn't do anything with it until there was one boy who decided he really wanted to work with this horse. And so he took a great deal of effort and time and, and energy focused on helping this animal. 
And eventually, the wild stallion was broken. Eventually, it became used to the hand. It became accustomed to being beneath someone else's authority. That is meekness, right there. What it really is is a harnessed power, power that that is focused. And you know, meekness is really not a part of our society, is it? We still think meek, weak. But if we are those who are to be filled, empowered, and directed by the Holy Spirit, meekness should truly exude from us. We should have this harness power that that drives us, that, that leads us. I mean, probably a word to help us understand meekness more than any other is the word submission. Submission. You know, if you have a submarine, sub means under or beneath, right? Marine, sea, or water, it's under the water. If you have submission, you are under mission, That is, you are under the jurisdiction, authority, guidance, or leadership of of someone else. And so it's obvious we submit to Jesus, right? We submit to his leading, his authority over our lives. But Colin Smith shares really a a few different areas in which we submit. Uh, Let me review some of those with you. The first area where it's necessary for submission is that we are to submit to the word of God, right? As the psalmist would share, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Uh, The Bible is just a beautiful roadmap for our lives to to give us discernment, right? To, To help us know between what's right and wrong, to know what to choose, how to live, Now, the danger is in our contemporary society, we can look upon Scripture as a nice list of suggestions. And we feel, well, I can kind of just pick, I like this one, yep, I'm going to do that. But but this one, no, I don't think I'm going to go there. But but Paul would write this to Timothy, his protege in the faith, right? He would share all Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what's true and to make us realize what's wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. I mean, that's the New Living Translation. Yeah, it truly helps us discern. And so if we are submitting to the word of God, we are placing our lives beneath the authority of it. I mean, I had a seminary professor share something kind of rocked our world as students as we were sitting there. The professor said, you know, by your becoming a pastor, and a minister of the gospel, you are three times more likely to go to hell than somebody else. Ouch, huh? What is that about? Well, each and every one of us, we are accountable to the authority of Scripture and whether we submit to it or not, whether we listen. And for those of us who teach and who preach the word, if we are guiding people in the wrong direction and leading them away from the authority of God's word, Look out, right? And so submitting, yeah, that's necessary for us to place ourselves beneath the authority of God's word. A second area that we are to submit, we need a submission to the will of God, right? We need to do what God wants. That is so perfectly clear as we look to the Garden of Gethsemane. The word Gethsemane means olive press and just as all of the olives would be gathered and the huge stone would be placed upon them to squeeze out that oil in the same way when Jesus is in that garden he has the sin of the world that is pressing down upon him right and there's this part of him that just wants to can I get out of this is there some way to turn back and I learned it's, it's pressed to such an extent, he, he's in anguish, he, he is sweating profusely and not just a liquid of sweat, but, but blood itself coming because he's in so much trauma. But in that situation, what he cries, um, 
Well, not my will. Thy will be done. In other words, God, if that's what you want, that's, that's what I want. And so our Lord freely submits. It's a harness power, isn't it? To truly give in to what God yearns for. That's the harnessing, isn't it? That's the bridle keeping him in check as he willingly is to endure the passion and all that he does for us. That's probably no surprise to us hearing those words. We submit to the authority of God's word, right? We submit to the word of God. We submit to the will of God. We're probably a little less comfortable with the next one. That is, we submit to God's people. In the fifth chapter of Ephesians, as Paul is writing to that church, he is sharing with them, if you have the Holy Spirit in you, uh, there are going to be things different about you. One thing you'll be found doing, you'll be singing hymns, psalms, spiritual songs. You'll be a songster. That, that those melodies will be in your heart and bubbling through your life as a reflection of the Spirit of God in you. Another thing that he shares, if you're full of of the Holy Spirit, you're going to be someone who's expressing gratitude. You'll be a person who gives thanks on a regular basis. But, but he's, he's sharing these things of what it is when you're filled with the Spirit. He gives this bizarre command. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submit to each other. And that's hard, isn't it? I mean, we're in this culture where you read on Facebook these posts that people have when they're just slamming one another. I mean, one of my friends from high school I was just speaking with recently had shared that, yeah, during COVID when he saw people in his church and the way they were treating one another, he figured, I don't need any of that anymore. And now he just watches church online. Uh, or, or think when it's the election season. And people are running for office, and do they just tell about their own character and how fitting they are to be in office? No, it's, it's nasty, isn't it? It's a, it's a slam campaign. How much can you smear somebody else through the mud? Ah, it gets ugly. You know, and even in the season we're in now in the life of our congregation, it's kind of where we are, huh? That... People have drawn lines, people have taken sides, people have pointed fingers of accusation. Uh, Things are ugly. And, And we can see firsthand that we don't agree on the best direction for the church to move forward. And we don't see eye to eye on how scripture is to be interpreted or or used in our lives. And uh, And the devil just sits back and smiles, thinking, man, this is just the way I wanted it. And it becomes a very poor witness for the entire community. Uh, Why? Because that bridle, that bit, that control of the Holy Spirit isn't really upon us. Uh, And so we end up sometimes doing things we wish we didn't do. I know we all have tempers that flare sometimes. I mean, sometimes we just blow up on our kids. Sometimes we have road rage. Sometimes we just fly off the handle. It's part of the human condition, isn't it? Let me offer you a few suggestions of how can we be meek? How can we have harnessed power Here's the suggestion number one. Remember how much you've been forgiven. Pretty amazing, isn't it? I mean, Matthew Henry in one of his commentaries shares of, you know, what if I would think of all of the offenses that I've committed against God? And what if God would treat me the exact same way as 
I would be treating other people? What if God would never release my offenses? What would happen to me? We know what would happen. I would face the wrath of God. We'd receive eternal condemnation. I mean, we have been forgiven of so much. Oh, oh, to grace how great a debtor, as Robinson says. We are indebted to God because why? Because he forgives us. He cleanses us. And then if we receive that, we also need to offer that. So one way of being meek is by someone who's willing to forgive. How about a second way of helping us to harness power, to remember to be meek? Don't think too highly of other people. What do I mean by that? It's interesting in Psalm 103 that God remembers that we are but dust. We ain't nothing but dust. To quote those great theologians in the music group Kansas, dust in the wind. All we are is dust in the wind, right? Sometimes we set too high of expectations on others because we expect for them to think the way that we do and believe the way that we do and act the way that we do, right? So in a congregation this size, there is such a diversity, isn't there? People thinking different ways, believing different ways. And even when it comes to our own spiritual growth and development, we are not on the same page, right? People are in very different places. Not everyone in the church of Jesus Christ is entirely sanctified. Maybe, maybe you figure that out. A couple months ago, I was walking up here near Garvey Manor. And my youngest was at a chorus rehearsal. And I was there where they're building a variety of new houses. And uh, there are different stages of development. Uh, There were some houses complete. People were living in them already. There were some houses where they were just putting on the finishing touches, uh, adding the siding or various things. It would be completed very soon. There were some that just had the, the frame up. You know, you could see the wood and the beams right there. There were others that just had footers that were poured, and and yet there were still others who had a clear pad where you could tell something was going to go there, but no work had been done on it yet. You know, just as it's that way with all those houses, it's it's that way in the spiritual lives of people. I mean, there's some who are near completion, right? God's been working on you your whole life long, and he's been changing you, huh? But there are others who just maybe come to faith and are just starting things out. And we can't expect for people who are at all those different phases and positions to be at the same place we are. And that's why it's necessary for us to uh, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Third suggestion that I would give us for being those who are meek is to fix our gaze or adjust where it is that we are focusing our attention. There was a Puritan pastor who once asked the question, why is it that during his intense suffering that Jesus could remain meek? You know what his answer was? It was because he didn't look to Judas and he didn't look to Pilate. He looked to his father. Let me break that down for a moment. When Jesus was hanging there on Calvary's cross, he could have been cursing out Judas. He could have said, I cannot believe that one of my own would do that to me. How could he ever, after seeing me in action, how could he betray me? Or he could have said that that Pontius Pilate is a pompous idiot, right? 
washes his hands of the whole thing, spineless, doesn't even try to take the action and yet hands me over for crucifixion. But through that entire ordeal, Jesus is not pointing fingers at those who would be perceived enemies. No, he's looking to his papa. He's looking to his God in heaven. And get this, you don't get anything else, get this church. We can spend a whole life looking at the people who wronged us, who drug us through the mud, who treated us like dirt. And we can allow that bitterness to fester in us for weeks or for months or for years or for an entire lifetime. Or we can choose to fix our gaze. And we can look at our papa. Because when we're looking at our papa, we're suddenly saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, right? It all depends on where we're looking. It all depends where our focus is. And if we are meek, we're focused on the Papa. We're focused on God. Well, back to this original picture. Let's look at Ferengo, Bixby, and Rogers for a moment. Are these individuals meek? Well, for Dr. David Banner, for the character, he's not meek, right? His power is not harnessed. He's got some anger control issues, right? And how about the Incredible Hulk? Is he meek? He is not harnessed power. He is power out of control, right? The big green monster. How about Fred Rogers? We might even think, well, if ever there was a guy who was gentle and meek, it's Mr. Rogers. Come on. Why is it in our mind we think of Jesus' meekness being gentleness? Uh, It can be perceived that way. You know why we think that way? It's Charles Wesley's fault. Charles Wesley wrote that hymn, Gentle Jesus, Meek and Mild. Or as Colin Smith says, the only reason why he used the word mild was because it was the only thing he could think of that rhymed with child, right? There ain't nothing mild about Jesus Christ. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is ferocious. He is power. But it's controlled. It's beneath the hand of God. God's hand controlling, guiding, leading. And my church, that's where we need to be. For blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Uh, All the blessings of God to be at our disposal. And if we would learn this lesson, to allow the power of the Holy Spirit to guide, nurture, and to to harness us, uh, it would truly take us to where God would want us to be. So may we be among not the weak, but the meek as we experience the fullness of submission to Jesus Christ, our Savior. Let's pray. Lord, would you teach us of meekness? Would you help us to know how to let that power flow through us? Lord, we do pray for our congregation. You might continue to give healing, give strength, uh, teach us to submit to each other, and Lord, to submit ultimately to you. For all this we pray in your holy name. Amen. I was blessed a few weeks ago to have Rick Wright staying at my house, um, an amazing man of God. But as Karen and I were sitting there at the dining table, something he shared with us was the your next season of ministry is going to be the greatest one of your lives. Uh, I had been texting with him following our disaffiliation vote, and he, he articulated the very same words. 
And then I was speaking to another pastor friend uh, uh, this past week, and he had shared the exact same words. Your, your best ministry is yet to come. You know, the last few years have been very challenging here at First Church, that in many ways I feel as I was more of a firefighter than I was a pastor because there were just several big issues to deal with, whether that was handling COVID, how to deal with staff issues, and also then how to handle this possible disaffiliation from the United Methodist Church. And um, I had originally, when I sent a letter to the district superintendent about my intentions for this next year, had shared, regardless of which way the vote went, I wanted to, to remain here to continue to serve. But um, when it got to early February, there are some things that just turned very ugly and some challenging things. I had received a letter about our, our special church conference being paused. And um, with receiving that letter and some of its contents, it... Um, really was the straw that broke the camel's back. And for me to, to realize, man, if the next season of my ministry is the greatest season, I just don't believe that's going to occur in the United Methodist Church. And so, um, effective July 1st, I will no longer continue to be the pastor here at First Church in Hollidaysburg. And um, certainly do appreciate for all of you who've continued to support and encourage and, and guide through this process. Um, the leadership team of our congregation will be meeting with the district superintendent uh, early this next week and begin talking about a profile of who the next pastor will be and how all that will unfold. But we do certainly appreciate your prayers through this process and, and trust that, that God will guide us uh, into his preferred future as we take those necessary steps of faith. So, thank you. Crossing the calm sea with Jesus The disciples were getting concerned The wind started violently blowing He was asleep in the stern Does he not care that we perish? We're helpless and we're so afraid. Jesus arose when they called him and said to them, Where is your faith? Because you prayed all night. You held on with all of your might. Child, your cries have awoken the master. Oh, he knows Lift your hands, it's time to rejoice. Child, your cries have awoken the master. Red hit you without any warning. The storm of your life had begun. You're thinking that surely you're down. You cried out for help from the Savior. And you know you can't give up now. Cause you prayed all night. You held on with all of your might. Child, your pride is awoken, master. Boy, you know your voice. Lift your hand. so deadly water so deep try to be patient cause soon he'll bring peace one word from his voice and it all must cease cause you prayed all night you held on with all of your might child your cries have awoken the master oh you know Lift your hands, it's time to rejoice. 
Shout your cries ever woke in the master. Shout your cries ever woke in the master. We are so grateful for your tithes, your gifts, your offerings that you give online or send into the church or drop off when you are here. Our church is still participating in um, this school year, the Tiger Pack program, where every week on Friday mornings or whatever the last day of school for the week is, um, there's a crew that comes in and packs backpacks full of food, and they go home over the weekend with kids who may not have enough to eat throughout the weekend. And so your generosity is allowing us to feed kids and families in our local area that don't have enough food. So thank you. And now may the God of all, his son Jesus, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Oh
The temple veil was torn wide open That before our God we may stand I will sing a love triumphant Hell strong gates were overcome For the grave it could not hold him Jesus Christ Measured 